at the heart of worship, it's always about love. Uh, we, it's always when we are choosing something or someone, and in the case of Christianity, uh, it's, it's Christ, and we're putting them above all else. It's the most important thing. Um, and the reason why I think music is so important in, in worship is uh, just music has this way of, of moving people's hearts and moving people's minds uh, into a place that a lot of things can't. I really believe that music is just this universal language that God created actually for all of us to be able to um, to commune together and then commune with Him. So it's just this beautiful um, picture of the church and the community of believers um, of something that we can all do together. In all of our preparation, we do all that we can to put the focus on Jesus. Um, in Amos it says, away with your noisy worship. And I believe that he's saying, uh, without authenticity, it's just noise. I want you to listen to this song inspired by the Holy Spirit uh, almost 3,000 years ago. And it's a call, it's a cry to us, to those who've come to the cross and received Jesus, to, to grow spiritually in a specific area. Listen to what God's word says in Psalm 95. Come, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Let us extol him with music and with song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all small g, idols, all gods of the world. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. How do I know that I'm growing up in my Christian faith? How do I know if, I, if I've come to the cross and received Jesus and confessed my sins? At that moment, you say, well, I became a Christian. I came to the cross. I received Jesus. Now it's done. I'm a Christian. No, 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 no. When you come to the cross and receive Jesus, it's just getting started. That's the beginning. And how do I know that I'm starting this journey of spiritual growth? And one of the ways we can know that we're growing more mature in our faith is that we're communicating with God more. We're praying. We're worshiping. We're connecting with God in the flow of our days throughout our lives. As a church, we have seven different areas that we think are sort of the biblical indicators that a person is growing in their faith. One of them we talked about a couple weeks ago is that our character looks more like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit starts to grow in us and our character looks like Jesus. That's a sign that we're growing spiritually. Another one we talked about last week was we're falling in love with this book, the Bible. We know it more, we read it more, and we actually do what it says. But a third marker that we can kind of look at and say, how am I doing in my spiritual growth? Is I'm com am I communicating with God more? Am I worshiping more passionately? Am I praying more often? Am I connecting with this God who made me and this God who loves me? Well, you might ask the question, you know, why? If, you know, if, if there's, and the number seven is a great biblical number, you know, but if there's seven markers of spiritual growth that we're gonna think about as a church, why would this be one of the seven? Well, here's some of the reasons. And just let these get inside your mind. I mean, why, why would you want to grow in prayer and worship? Here's a reason. Because prayer and worship unleash heavenly power in our lives and in the world. There is power in prayer. Someone say amen. amen. There is power in prayer. There is power in worship. And the power of God is unleashed as we communicate with God. Why? Because prayer and worship connect us to God and help us hear him as well as experience his presence. If you want to be connected to God to experience his presence, then communicate with him. Talk to him in prayer. Sing to him in praise. Celebrate him and declare his goodness. Those things draw us closer to God. That's a good reason why. Here's a third reason why we should want to grow in prayer and worship. 
Because worship and prayer bring glory, praise, and delight to our creator, and he deserves it. Someone say amen. amen. I mean, God deserves our praise. And when we pray, when we sing, when we worship, it glorifies God. Imagine a child coming to a parent. Whether that child is three or four, or 15 or 16, or whether that child's in their 30s. Imagine a child coming to a parent and looking at them and saying, Dad, Mom, thank you. You've been so good to me. You've provided so much. You've sacrificed so much. I'm so thankful that you're my mom. I'm so thankful that you're my dad. Wouldn't that parent just glow? And some parents are like, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> you know, my kids are in their 30s or 40. When's it coming? You know, but for a parent to be like, that'd be amazing. Well, God is our heavenly father and he delights in our praise and our worship. And when we pray and when we talk to him, he delights in that. that. That would be reason enough to grow as a worshiper, just to please the heart of God. But there's another reason. Prayer and worship are a command and not a suggestion. Did you know that the Bible says, come sing to the Lord, come worship the Lord, come give praise to God, sing a new song to the Lord. It's not a suggestion. If you've come to the cross and you've received Jesus Christ, or if you're not yet a Christian and you come to that place where you receive Jesus, prayer and worship and praise of God, this is, this is an expectation of what Christians do. So we need to be serious about growing more intense and more focused and more consistent in how we worship and praise God. I love the story in John chapter 4. Jesus and his disciples are traveling through an area called Samaria. It was an area that the Jewish people at that time, and Jesus and his disciples had a Jewish bloodline and Jewish history. They would avoid that area because of a long time civil war centuries before, but there was just reasons they avoided the Samaritans. But they traveled through there. And Jesus engages this woman in a conversation. Now, no rabbi in the ancient world would talk with a woman in public. It just didn't happen. And you certainly wouldn't talk theology and talk about God stuff. But Jesus broke all the rules. And he talked with a woman who was a sinner, who was mixed up, who was a Samaritan. And they talked Bible theology stuff, which was amazing. Jesus going, man, I just want to connect with people. He set the rules aside. And in that conversation, they begin talking about worship. What's the right place to worship? How do you worship? And here's what Jesus says to this woman. He says, this is John 4, 23 and 24. Jesus says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, and in truth with an authentic life and heart. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Listen to this. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Do you understand that the maker of heaven and earth, the one true God, is seeking and looking for people who will be authentic worshipers. That's the heart of God. We need to take this seriously. Now, when I became a Christian, when I became a follower of Jesus, I, and many of you know, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up singing Christian songs, going to Sunday school. I didn't have a Bible. I knew nothing. And when I became a Christian, I believed in Jesus. I came to the cross. I confessed my sins. I received him. I was in his family. I did not like worshiping. It just... I didn't want to do it. So I'd go to things. I'd just kind of stand there when they were singing. It's like, I'd kind of look around. Everybody's singing. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, get to, the, get to the teaching part. I like the Bible, but the singing is weird. And so well, here's what happened. I went on this journey, and I, as I looked back, I realized there, there, were, there were four W's on this journey that I went in terms of moving towards becoming a worshiper. Here's the first W. I thought worship was weird. I was like, my first W is weird. I'd look at this and go, this is creepy. I was kind of hold hands, sway back and forth, kumbaya, lift your hands, weird. It just, it just creeped me out. Can I, just, can I be honest as a pastor with you? I didn't grow up with any of this stuff, and so when I became a Christian, I'm like, I love Jesus, but this worship thing is just weird. And I just, so I just didn't get involved in it. I just came and just hung out, but I waited until that was over with. And then the second W, after time, I began to wonder I would kind of want, I'd watch these people that were worshiping, and I would, I would go, what's, hap they, they, what's happening inside of them? They seem connected to God. They seem filled with joy. And I kind of wanted, I wondered at what they had, and I kind of wanted that. And I started to wonder, could I ever like, learn to worship? Because at that point, I didn't, it was just weird. I didn't want to do it. So I started to wonder. Here's my third W, and this is going to seem strange to many people. I began to read the Bible and, and hear the scriptures say, come and worship the Lord, sing praise to him, glorify him. And I thought, God wants me to do this. And I'm not interested. Here's my third W. Work. I started to work at worshiping. 
I went and bought a guitar and learned about eight or nine chords, which is about all I needed to learn about 100 worship songs. And so um, I got a guitar, and I would just sit in my room, and I would learn songs, and I would just try to praise God because I wanted to please my father. And it didn't come naturally for a long time. And I get with other people, and I, and I, and I, and, and after, and I gotta be honest, about two years, I worked at this worship thing until it became part of me. I don't know why it was so hard for me, but I knew I wanted to glorify God. I knew it would please my father if I could learn to sing praise to him. So for two years, I just worked at it. And somewhere along the way, a couple years into this whole journey of being a Christian, here's the fourth W, I became a worshiper. I took joy and delight in worshiping God, but it was a journey. Some of you are still at the first step of that journey. I know this because I worship, when we start to worship, I worship up there in the balcony. I kind of, I'm praying and looking at everybody and singing praise, but I worship down here. So I get to see a lot of people. And there's a lot of people exactly where I was. So this is weird. This is silly. I'm gonna drink my coffee. I'm gonna stand here if you make me stand, but get this over. And then I won't open my mouth. I won't sing. And there's just kind of, this isn't my thing. And I see people who I know are committed Christians. And, and, and I don't judge you because I was there. But can I challenge you to start to work at worshiping? Can I challenge you to start to open your mouth and start singing even if you don't like your own voice? Because God does and he's, he's seeking people to worship him. He's waiting that you will just give your praise to him and say, God, I'll give you the best I have. It took me a couple years. So be patient with yourself. But there's a journey of growing in worship. And I want to invite those of you that are in that, this is weird, or I wonder if I could do this phase, to just begin working at worshiping, be engaged, get, let your heart be part of things, begin to sing praise to God. Maybe when you're alone somewhere, just begin to sing to God and let it become part of who you are. Then there's the what. What can we measure as we grow as worshipers and people of prayer? You say, well, if metrics is measurements that matter, can I actually measure how am I doing in connecting with God and communicating with God in prayer and in worship. And I think there's very specifics that you can measure. We're going to give you a survey tool in a couple of weeks that'll help you start looking at your own life and seeing how you're doing. But here's some things we can measure. How often we talk to God. You know, do I talk to God in prayer once a week, once a month, once a day, three times a day, 10 times a day, all day long? I mean, we can see how much am I really singing, praising, talking to God, praying. And here's another thing we can measure. How often we listen to God and hear from him. Do I actually slow down? And say, God, how would you have me care for my children? Lord, how would you have me grow in my faith? And I'm quiet. And do I take time on a regular basis and actually listen for God to speak? Because God does want to speak to his children. We can measure our engagement in worship. Am I passive or active? We were just talking about that. We can measure, am I more engaged as a worshiper? Or am I less engaged? And I can see how I'm doing, how I'm growing. How naturally we lift up praise and adoration. Does it take time to kind of work at it and ramp it? So I come to church and by the first song, I'm not interested in the second song, I'm kind of getting there. Third song, I'm sorry, you know, I just got to, or do I just kind of, can I just jump right into worship? We say, how am I doing in just, because I think if I'm living as a worshiper all week long, then I'm going to gather with God's people, I'm ready, I'm in. Why? Because I've been worshiping all week, I've been worshiping and communicating with God all week long. And so, so how, do we, you know, how do we kind of engage naturally, do it more and more naturally? How honestly we confess Confession is a big part of worship. There's a lot of confession in the Bible. I love 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins, listen to this, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Am I quick to confess? God, I'm sorry, I messed up. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have spoken that way. I shouldn't have acted that way. Give me strength to change. I think we can see how we're growing as people who confess quickly to the Lord. And we can see the results we see from our prayers. Do we expect answers and do we see them? Do we actually ask of God and when he answers, we actually remember how he's been faithful in the past and that inspires us to pray in the future. I love the, I love the book of James. It's one of the most practical, down-to-earth, kind of in-your-face books in the Bible. And in James chapter five, verses 13 to 14, he's talking about life and prayer and worship. And here's what he says. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Let them worship. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. I love this. Having a hard time? Pray. Things are going good? Praise. Things are really bad? Get some other people together and pray some more. It sounds like prayers like all over the place. And that's the point. We're communicating with God. We're connecting with him as in the flow of life. 
So what does it look like? The when and the where. The where and the when. Ways we can go deeper in prayer and worship. And I want to encourage you to, to pick one or two of these and start trying to do it in your own life. And if you're a note taker, you can write them all down. But at least if each person say, here's a couple things that resonate for me. I'm going to take this next step forward in growing as a worshiper, growing in prayer. So here's some ideas. Setting a time and a place for prayer. You know, Jesus got up early in the morning and usually went outdoors, got away from people. And he prayed. Great example. Find, now, you should pray all through the day, but there's something about having a time and a place each day that you sort of set aside. It might be three to five minutes. It might be 10 or 15 minutes. It might be a half an hour. But there's a time and a place you kind of go and pray. There's something good about that. That might be a, a, an action item for some of you. Keeping a journal. Writing some prayers. Particularly your prayer requests so you can keep track of when God answers prayers. You can highlight and put stars. Answered prayer. Answered prayer. Go, God, you're so good. But keep a journal of prayers and, and, and of your worship to God. Using a prayer list. I have five prayer lists, actually, and I keep them in my, in my journal, and they're in the back of my journal, and I try to every day take them out, and I try to pray for six to eight people every day. And so I have Shoreline's prayer list that we have every week. When we get a new one, I take it, fold it in half, tuck it in there, and then when I pray for somebody, I put the date next to their name. And then I've got a prayer list for my family, and I've got a prayer list for some friends going through some tough times. I have prayer list for people I love that I want to come and know and see Jesus. And, and so, and what's nice about every time I pray, I put a date by them, because I'll think, oh, I just prayed for them a couple days ago, and I'll go, oh, that was two weeks ago. And it lets me see how I'm doing in actually making prayer and crying out to God for other people a part of my lifestyle. And then spontaneous prayer and worship. There's something about just going through a day and when something happens where God shows up or God does something good or just kind of teaches you something, just to stop and say, thank you, Lord. And, and, and if you're able to, if you're in the right setting, just to pause and really just give him praise. I had this happen a couple mornings ago. I was in our, in our bedroom at home, and Sherry's still recovering from a shoulder surgery, so I was kind of making the bed and cleaning up, and when I make the bed, it takes a while because we have like 87 pillows that have to be decoratively organized. I'm exaggerating, of course, but there's lots of them. And so, so I'm making the bed, and I'm kind of straightening up the bedroom, and so I just had my phone on, and I, and I had put on YouTube, and I had put on worship music. I had set it up on a shelf, and I just had music playing while I was straightening up. And, uh, and this song came on. Have you ever had a song that you have? I hadn't heard it before, but I just kind of stopped, and I'm like, and I just started listening to the words, and it was about the, the sacrifice of Jesus and the price he paid and the greatness of his grace. And then, then a little bit later, it was kind of like about the resurrection. And I was kind of like just kind of getting the message in my head. So, I, so when it finished, I went over and I just hit repeat, and I had it play again for me. And then this time, as it got to the, about two minutes into the song, I, I realized that the storyline of the song was really the cross of Christ to the resurrection. And, and this was the line. I wrote it down. So I'm just standing in my living I'm standing in my bedroom listening to this song while I'm straightening up. And, and the, the singer sings this. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. And the song goes completely silent, which doesn't happen very often in music. Completely silent for a couple seconds. And then there's a sound, and I realize it's, it's like an earthquake. Like, like, the, like the stone of the tomb being rolled away. And the next line says this. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. And I, and I just stood there and said, that's what Jesus did for me. I think I played that song about 10 times in a row. <laughs> you ever done that with a song where you just, it just touches your heart and you just, you just keep? I played like 10 times in a row and the first couple times I just stopped making the bed. I stopped cleaning the room and I just stood in the middle of our bedroom and I just said, God, you died on the cross. You're, and I just worshiped. You know, you can do that anywhere. I mean, if you're out in the street, it's probably weird. You know, you got to be careful. But if you're in your somewhere private, you know, and just take those moments and let God sweep you into his presence. Singing with passion among the people of God, being mentally, spiritually, and emotionally engaged. When we sing together, we talked about it. I want to challenge you. When, if you're a follower of Jesus, when we sing together, will you learn to sing praise to God? Physical expression. What's happening on the inside of us is shown outwardly. We lift our hands, we kneel, standing, dancing, lying flat on our face. Those are all physical expressions that the Bible talks about. And some are probably more for private worship, some are more for public worship. But there's a sense that when your heart's encountering God, your body engages. And there's, there's more than just kind of standing closed and just listening or singing. There's a sense of the, that we're drawn into God's presence. So the Bible talks about, about expressing ourselves physically. Commitment to coming to church regularly and teaching our family to do the same. Can I give you a strong pastoral encouragement? Will you make being part of corporate worship with God's people? If you're visiting from another church, your home church, wherever you go, 
Will you make that one of the highest priorities in your life? And will you teach your children and grandchildren to do the same? There, there's a whole generation of young people leaving the church. I think there's lots of reasons, but I, I think one of the biggest reasons is this. They were taught that this isn't that important. Sports or church? Sports. Academics or church? Academics. Fun family time or church? Fun, I mean, you, you, if kids watch and everything, if everything is, that's more important than, than this. They're, our kids and grandkids are watching us. And I think we need to teach that, th- that there's something that happens when we're together like this that doesn't happen when we're alone with Jesus. I, I believe that. I've experienced it over and over again. Now, you can totally encounter God one-on-one. People say, I meet God out in the woods. So do I. I meet God by the ocean. So do I. But there's something about being together, and the Bible talks about this again and again. Do not neglect the gathering together as some people are doing, but do this more and more as you see the day approaching, Hebrews says. The more you see the coming of Christ, and, and, and I tell you, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I know that today it's one day sooner or closer than it was yesterday. So it's approaching, right? And, and, and so to say this is a priority. Making choices about the music we listen to throughout the day. There's lots of great music out there. But I want to challenge you. You know, go, go on, go on your, you know, put load stuff on your phone or your, or your tablet or your computer and there's great Christian music and, and, and put that into the mix for yourself. I probably listen, I, 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 YouTube, I've got it set up where I get no commercials. And so I'll just put on, I'll just, sometimes I'll just put in a great hymns of praise and I'll put it on a mix and it'll just play hymns for me all day long. And when I'm working, I actually have music in the background and, I, and so I don't hear it so it's sort of in the background, but I'll be I'll sometimes eight or nine hours one day where I'm just listening to hymns. A praise, newer versions, older versions. Sometimes I'll put just new praise music. Or I'll put in Hillsong, which is a great worship team, a worship ministry in Australia, and I'll listen to that music. And then I'll kind of, but then sometimes when I'm working, all of a sudden a song will come on, I'll just stop. And just, oh, wait, oh, yeah, and I just start to worship. I want to challenge you to look at the music you listen to and make sure that you're putting great worship. If you, you, if you, have, you, you use YouTube and you put in there praise wor- and worship music, it'll play music for you all day long. And so, Make that part of your life. Bursts of praise, thanks, honor, and celebration. Look for those moments where God does something and just stop and say, thank you, Lord, wonderful, back to what I'm doing. But just have those moments where it just kind of bursts out of you. Praying with others. When you're with other Christians, pray more with them. Oh, I've never done that. I've never been with these Christian friends and said, shall we pray together? We were out with a couple a couple nights ago uh, for dinner, and I think we prayed together four times. We prayed before the meal came, but then some, a conversation came about somebody and a need and a kind of a challenge, and somebody said, well, let's just stop and pray about that. We prayed together at the table. Then a little later, something came up, and then we prayed again. And it, was, it wasn't like we planned it. We just, as we were talking, it's almost like we had the sense that Jesus was there with us. So why not invite him into the conversation? You know, why not just talk with Jesus with other Christians? Make that more a part of your life, and that'll grow you in prayer and grow you in worship. Worship with others in spontaneous ways. What if we were with other Christians and we're just talking about life and stuff and faith. And, and what if somebody said, hey, can we spend some time worshiping together? So that's, that'd be kind of weird or strange. Well, maybe, but maybe not. I remember when I first became a Christian, I got that guitar and I was working at worshiping. A couple years into the journey, I always had my guitar in the uh, trunk of my car. And I, just, and I, would just, I, I was growing to love to worship. And I was volunteering with the Costa Mesa High School, a group of about a dozen young guys, or most of them were water polo players, went to Costa Mesa High School, new Christians, and most of them grew up in non-Christian homes. And I'd get, to, get together with these guys and do different things. And, and on a regular basis, we'd be hanging out and doing something. And one of the guys would say, is your guitar in the trunk of your car? And I'd say, yeah, it's always there. I said, maybe we can go somewhere and worship for a while. These are 14, 15, 16-year-old kids. And we found ourselves a lot of times going to, the, to go into the parking lot at South Coast Plaza, the top part where it was open to the sky, and just putting a couple of our cars up there and just spending an hour or two worshiping and praising God together. And I wasn't a good guitar player, and they weren't necessarily the greatest singers in the world. (laughs) But it didn't matter. As I think about it, those are some of the sweetest moments of worship in my life. With these young guys who are just growing to love Jesus, and they just wanted to sing praise to God. Why don't we do that more? Or if you watch a great worship song on YouTube, just somebody comes over and says, can we watch this together? And can we just, just take a moment and just worship God as we watch, watch it and just share those moments with others. There's something beautiful about that. Praying with eyes wide open. Understanding that you can pray anytime, anywhere. Praying is not limited to a certain place or a certain posture. It's in the mix of our lives. In Chronicles, there's this beautiful passage. You may have heard it before. It might be new to some people, but I love this. 
Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, God says, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's God's voice speaking to his children. Ephesians 6.18 says this, and listen to all of the alls. It says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That's four alls or always in one verse. That's a lot of prayer. But the idea is that we're engaging with God. So let me give you a couple of hows, some really practical ways. And, and these are things that, that may connect for some of you, may not for others, but, but maybe you can find one or two of these that work for you. Here's some practical challenges. How about a 30-day challenge with a daily prayer list? That you, you come up with a prayer list and just list the names of, of people and such circumstances you want to pray for. And for 30 days, you try to find five or 10 minutes every day just to pray for those things. And just see what happens in that journey. Two-month worship commitment at church being fully engaged in every part of the service. Say, for the next eight weeks, I will be at church. And if you're, again, if you're a guest from another church, go to that church. But, but say, I will be in church for eight weeks running. And I will be fully engaged. When we're greeting, I'm going to actually get up and greet people. And when we're singing, I'm going to sing with all my heart. And when we're giving, I'm going to give something. And when we're studying the Bible, I'm going to, I'm going to dig in and, and, and really try to learn and say, God, teach me. And, and you, the whole experience, say, I'm going to give myself. Try that for two months and see what happens. You'll never go back. You will never go back if you try that. Writing a psalm of praise, confession, or adoration. I challenge you to write out your own prayer, your own song of praise to God. And if you want to put it to music and sing it, when I, when I was about 17 or 18 and really start, starting to grow in worship, I started writing songs, but I would just, just for me and Jesus, and I would just drive in the car, just make up songs as I was driving along. I didn't ever try to write them down. I didn't share them with anybody else. But I just started singing songs. And they were, I'm sure they were just horrible from a musical standpoint. But I think God loved it. I know God did. A silent retreat. Take an hour. Go to, we got a beautiful ocean area here. Take an hour, go down to the ocean. Leave your phone in the car, leave all your technology away. If you have a watch that brings stuff to you, leave it in the car and just be a rebel, you know? And just for an hour, uh, for an hour, just be quiet and say, God, speak to me. God, remind me of your love. God, direct me where you want me to go. You know, we send high school kids off to camps and stuff and they go, oh, I had this life-changing experience where they made us go alone for like an hour and just be quiet. And it'd be neat to do that again maybe in a couple years when I go to another camp. Right, because that's the only time you can do that, right? <laughs> no, just go take a walk and leave the, the noisy things behind and just talk to Jesus. Listen, be quiet, memorize prayers. Uh, I'd encourage you to read and even memorize and learn to pray from great prayers through history. We're gonna put on the website this week, I, I came with about seven to 10 prayers from great people from the first century till now. Are these amazing, kind of short prayers, but these beautiful prayers. And let those prayers guide you. You can go online and pull those down and just learn from people. You know, learn, learn to pray with these great prayers through history. Praying the Psalms and the Scriptures. Let the Scriptures guide your prayer. Read a Psalm and make it your prayer. Let it teach you to pray. Prayer in action. Try prayer walking. Just walk somewhere. Do, do like a, do a half an hour walk or 15 minute walk and just spend that time praying. And keep your eyes open and just whatever you see, let God guide your prayer. Our pastors went this last week and we did probably an hour prayer walk where we went out from here, down Garden Road and up around the airport, and we just prayed together as we walked. And it was beautiful, it was powerful. You can do it alone or with other people. And then pray for a church leader, past or present. Identify a church leader that has impacted your life and spend the next week praying for them. Some, I'd encourage some of you to pray for Howie and Linda Hugo. Some of you don't know who they are, but he, Howie's the one that founded this church. Their family poured their lives into Shoreline Church. And if you start praying for them, send them a note and say, I'm praying for you, and is there anything special? I could, I'd love to see a couple hundred people Send the Hugos a note and say, We're pray I'm praying for you this week. What can I pray for? And just lift them up day by day. That would be a blessing. Ever. Pick another pastor at Shoreline or a leader at Shoreline or at your home church and pray. I want to finish by giving you a vision, the who. Ways your life can change because you intentionally grow in prayer and worship. Who will you become if you grow in maturity in this area of life? Who will you become if you start growing in your communication with God through prayer and worship? Here's five things I believe will happen in you if you walk this road, if you take it seriously. You'll have fresh encounters with God. You're gonna meet God in new ways that you haven't met God before because you're, you're seeking to draw near to him more. Renewed power and strength to live for Jesus. When you're near God, he fills you with power. He fills you with the strength you need that you're saying, God, I'm feeling weak. Be near him, he'll fill you up. 
Deeper joy in worship and in life. You're gonna find joy flooding your life as you grow in worship and prayer. More answers, more leading, and more of a sense of God's nearness. You're gonna hear more answers to prayer than you've heard before because you're praying to God more. And God will be glorified and you will be edified. You will be strengthened and matured in faith. Look at that list. If you're a follower of Jesus, don't you wanna have encounters with God have greater power in your life, greater joy, more answers to prayer leading in your life, and have God glorified. Anybody want that? Say amen. amen. I mean, that, that's our desire. This is a pathway to get there. God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Oh God, we pray together right now that you will teach us to be worshipers. For those who are here, they're not yet followers of Jesus. God, would you let them know that you love them, that you died on the cross for them, you rose again, and you offer them forgiveness. You want to be in a relationship with them. It's not religion, it's a relationship. And for those who are followers of Jesus in this room today and in the family worship venue and online, we pray that you will teach us how to worship with greater passion, teach us how to pray with greater fervency, and teach us how to live lives that are connected to you. We want to mature and grow in faith, and we believe that growing in prayer and worship is a key part of this journey. And Lord, for those people who, who still look at worship and this stuff as kind of weird, I pray that they would begin to wonder what you might do in their lives and begin to work at worshiping to the point where they one day become a passionate worshiper. Jesus, we love you. We thank you and we worship you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to do something uh, different at Shoreline that we don't, we don't know, normally do this on Sunday mornings. We do this on nights of worship on Wednesday nights. But since we're talking about worship this morning, we are going to share communion together. We're going to come, we're going to, come to the table, or we're actually going to bring the table to you. We're going to, in, a, in a few moments, we're going to pass the elements, and you're going to receive the bread and the cup. And so I want you to listen to God's word. These are words the Apostle Paul was inspired to write by the Holy Spirit about this very moment we're going to experience. It's found in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. The Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we do in this moment of communion together. I want to share a few words before the, before the servers begin to serve the elements. Um, first, a communion is an experience for those who have come to the cross and received Jesus. So if you're here today, and we always have many people at Shoreline that are still trying to figure out the Christian faith. They haven't yet accepted Jesus, but they're investigating the Christian faith or they're coming with friends and family. Please don't feel pressure to be part of this. When the elements come to you, just hand them to the next person. But I want to encourage you to watch the people around you because for those who know Jesus, this is a very sacred, important moment for us. You might even want to ask somebody, you know what? Tell me what that means to you to have communion. But again, if you've not become a Christian yet, then this, this is something that won't make sense to you. Just feel free to pass the elements by. If you're here from another Christian church, you, you're part of a Bible-believing Christian church, and you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, we invite you to partake of communion with us. Because this isn't the table of Shoreline Church. This is the table of Jesus. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, this is the table he invites you to. And so when the elements come, please partake of those and, 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 and you know, hold those and we'll partake together. Uh, we're going to, today as we do communion, in just a moment, the ushers are going to be serving communion. When you receive the bread and the cup, will you just hold those in your hands and just use this time to reflect on what this moment means. And then after a little while, I'll invite us to partake together kind of as a sign of our unity in Christ. We'll partake together at the same time. So when the elements come, please hold those. Ushers, would you please begin to serve us and pass out the elements? And I want to ask you to think about three different things as you receive the bread and the cup or as you're waiting to receive them about what this means. Jesus said two different times, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So what, what are you going to remember right now as you're waiting to receive the elements or as you receive the elements? I want to encourage you to remember what Jesus did when he came to this world. Remember that he left heaven and he came born of a virgin among us. He lived with no sin. 
Remember how he loved the children. Remember how he healed the broken. Remember how he reached out to the outcast. Remember the life of Jesus. When you hold the elements, remember the death of Jesus, the price he paid on the cross for you to take away your sins and your punishment. Remember the cross where he died. Remember the tomb where they put his body. And for three days, he was dead. And when you hold these elements, remember that Jesus Christ rose from the dead with new life and new hope in glory and in power, defeating sin and defeating death. When we come to communion, it's also important to search our hearts. I want to encourage you this morning to even right now begin thinking, Lord, what are the things in my heart that I really need to take and bring to you? There's no better time than to bring, bring what you're struggling with, what you're, what you're fearful about, what you're anxious about. There's no better time than communion. Say, Lord Jesus, as I partake of your, this memorial, remembering your body, remembering your shed blood, I need your help. So reflect on your life and where you need him and just begin praying and talking to him about that. Lord, I need your help. I need your guidance. I need your wisdom. I need your strength. And then the third and final thing that's really important during communion is confession. If there's hidden sin in your lives or public sin in your life, and this is the time to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I've come to the cross, I've received you, I know I'm forgiven, but Lord, I begin to wander and do this or that or think this way or that way or talk this way or that way. And I just bring it to you and say, Jesus, I confess my sins, I confess my brokenness. And in a moment as I partake of this reminder of, of your sacrifice for me to pay the price, I remember the price you paid at the cross. Let's just take a minute of quiet that you can remember, that you can search your heart, and that you can confess. And we'll continue serving the elements, and then we'll partake together in just a moment. Let's take a quiet moment of prayer. holding these elements in our hands or just now receiving them. We remember that your body was broken. We remember that your blood was shed. We remember, Jesus, that you said, no one takes your life from you, but you lay it down. And so you chose to give yourself for us. So as we come to the table together today, we remember you, Jesus. We thank you for this gift. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. 
He took it and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Let's remember Jesus Christ and the price he paid as we partake of the bread together. Let's partake. After that supper, Jesus took the, the cup. He said to his followers, this is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you partake of this, remember me. Remember the price he paid. Remember that he bore your sins and took your punishment and poured out his love on you. Let's partake of the cup together. Jesus, for your broken body, for your shed blood, for your willing sacrifice, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We worship you. We praise you, O oh Lord.